Good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? Great. Fantastic. Uh, did everyone have fun last night? Yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you for uh, Delphi for sponsoring the industry party. Um, what I wanted to do this morning was share some reflections I had, um, think about yesterday, and substantiate a couple of claims I had made yesterday and maybe describe why I have so much conviction about them. Uh, the first reflection uh, is something that I thought was so exciting about the Adidas presentation uh, by Fernando and uh, Marcus. Uh, you know, I think what we all have in common in this room is that we all are dissatisfied with the current ways of working, that we all know that the, you know, how we work typically now is not going to help our organizations survive and thrive in the marketplace. And my genuine belief is that you know, the people in this room, uh, these are the people who are going to be pioneering the practices that you know, in 10 years we will all be taking for granted. What I thought was so interesting about the Adidas presentation was you know, what they pulled off. So uh, Marcus described that 2 a.m. meeting with their CIO, right, about how that kicked off something um, that led to the birth of this platform team. And what I loved about that was what that agreement was. Essentially, the agreement was that 5% of all the software engineers uh, and technologists from each one of the business units would be essentially uh, given to this shared service to create the platform team. And so they were all given the option of opting out. In other words, they could keep uh, you know, their 5% of software developers, but then they wouldn't be able to leverage the platform that they're creating. In other words, they could do it themselves, and they had 100% adoption rate. So. Uh, one of the things I genuinely believe is that in the years to come, I think we're going to be hearing many stories about how people heard about what Adidas did, and we'll be sharing you know, uh, how they were able to replicate those outcomes. So uh, that was something I just found really, really exciting. Um, and I think what all of the presentations yesterday have in common uh, is that they're all stories of transformational leadership. One of the coolest findings from the State of DevOps report uh, actually came out last year. And one of the things that we looked at was, to what extent do organizations uh, exhibit these traits from their leadership? And there are five domains of capabilities, or five domains. The first is vision. To what extent do people have, do their leaders understand where the organization is going? Uh, what are the most important problems and uh, goals and aspirations of the organization? And to what extent can that leader get in front of those goals, not just to be relevant, but to help with the achievement of the most important things facing the organization? The second one is intellectual stimulation. To what extent does the leader uh, challenge status quo? To what extent do they uh, c uh, question basic assumptions of how we do work? The third is inspirational communication. To what extent can the leader uh, you know, create a sense of excitement? maybe overcome very deeply seated fears about what does this do to our careers or uh, to our functional silo? And you know, can they create coalitions around them you know, to create the coalitions of the willing? Uh, the fourth is supportive leadership, uh, and the fifth is personal recognition. So the, the last two, personal recognition and supportive leadership, that's often um, characterized as servant leadership, as popularized by the Agile movement. The difference between pers uh, between uh, servant leadership and transformational leadership is that transformational leaders also focus equally on the needs of the organizations, not just on the needs of the followers. And one of the most decisive findings from uh, the State of DevOps report last year was that leadership matters. You know, if you took the uh, bottom third of those organizations with self-reported transformational leadership leader behaviors, are only one half as likely to be high performers. In other words, it's possible, but uh, just a lot less likely. And what was also astonishing is that it also, the study also showed that leadership is not enough, right? Leaders don't actually do any work, right? Leaders who hang out with other leaders, they just give PowerPoint presentations to each other, right? Leaders need great teams, they need great technical practices and architecture that helps enable teams to work independently, right? And so all those in combination, right, that is what leads to high performance. So leadership amplifies all those characteristics that we talked about. So uh, I hope you saw that in the presentations from yesterday. Uh, the other uh, thing I mentioned yesterday is I had made this claim that I believe that the majority of economic value that DevOps will create is not going to be through the fangs, the Facebooks, Amazons, Netflix, and Googles, uh, but instead it is organizations uh, represented in this room today, right? the largest brands across every industry vertical, uh, every not-for-profit government agency. Um, and that um, 
belief actually began probably around 10 miles from here. Uh, I was at DevOps Days in London in 2011. I was uh, talking to a good friend of the DevOps Enterprise community, Chris Little, uh, who's now at Gartner. And he, had, he said, I agree with you, Gene. He said, in fact, there's probably going to be a 20 to 30 year period of a golden age of unprecedented economic prosperity. <laughs> and so my reaction is like, well, that was a very specific claim he made, <laughs> right? So on, by on what basis does he believe that? And that's when he introduced me to the work of Dr. Carlotta Perez. And uh, she's now at the London School of Economics here. And so what was uh, so um, appreciated by her work was a certain observations that she made. Uh, she said, you know, she noticed that these, there's this, you know, five, um, there's these economic cycles that we go through, uh, that there's been five uh, major surges in development, uh, including the Industrial Revolution. And essentially her claim was that we are now entering the fifth. But what, what made her work novel was that essentially she was positing why we go through this boom and bust and why uh, it creates these multi-decade periods of economic prosperity. And so, uh, in other words, she was positing a causal mechanism of what causes uh, these economic cycles. Uh, and by the way, the book is called Technical Revolutions and Financial Capital, The Dynamics of Bubbles and Golden Ages. And so here's what uh, she says. She says essentially these, the causal factors are uh, because of these six reasons. One, a critical factor of production suddenly becomes very cheap. So whether that was uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the use of steam and rail, uh, steel and heavy engineering, uh, mass production in the automobile, and now with information, computers, and technology, something that was very expensive now becomes very, very cheap. That then leads to a whole new set of infrastructure being built and this wild west period of a laissez-faire period of wrenching innovation that's followed by a bubble. That always is followed by uh, a post-bubble crash, um, a re-institution, uh, a reassertion of institutional authority and regulation, and then finally a period of consolidation and widespread gains in the productivity from using this new technology. Right? Um, and her claim is that it is in this second phase of production capital that really is where the wealth is created. So what uh, she calls it the turning point uh, the, uh, between the deployment age, deployment period and installation period. Her observation is that the first phases are fueled by financial capital. So that's raising money from Wall Street or uh, uh, our banker friends from across the street here, um, venture capital, right? Those are what fuel uh, this innovation. Then comes the boom, then comes the crash, and then we figure out what this technology is actually good for. Um, and that is fueled not by financial capital, but that is fueled by production capital. So all the stories that we heard yesterday um, were not um, organizations, Nike, raising money to improve the technical practices. They were using their own operating capital to, uh, to win in the marketplace. And so you know, I think we are seeing uh, this happening right now as we talk about digital disruption. You can see it in, I love this graph that shows uh, the market caps, 20, uh, 2006 versus 2016, uh, right? And this, uh, this shows how disruptive the, the fangs are. Um, but I love this observation that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. In other words, uh, there's this great graph that was uh, released by Goldman Sachs that shows essentially the percentage of all retail transactions of Amazon and Walmart uh, that's on the y-axis and the x-axis is um, versus the years since their IPO. And what you can see is that Amazon's share of all retail transactions is tracking almost exactly like Walmart did uh, when they went public. And so I, th you know, I, th I think it's amazing to see that you know, these things have happened before um, and they will be happening you know, across every industry vertical. So I believe the stories at this conference are exactly as Dr. Perez describes and predicts, that it is uh, the largest, most respected brands in every industry vertical, exploiting the technology miracles that were created by uh, financial capital, by the fangs, um, that the productivity gains will be so evident uh, that we'll finally solve this 30 year mystery we have about the productivity paradox, right? The economists, you know, they've had trouble for decades identifying where is the productivity gains from technology. And you know, I think we are now going to see it over the next 20 to 30 years. And it does really set the stage for a multi-decade period of economic prosperity. I, I think the other thing that 
I find very hopeful about this is that the age before the crash, the age of financial capital, that is typically a period of ever increasing wealth inequality. And it is only through the deployment age uh, that we deploy production capital that rises, you know, that's the tide that lifts all boats. Um, and that actually does create prosperity across a much broader population. And that's what leads to, I think, a more just society as well. So uh, one of the things that uh, Jeffrey Snover mentioned uh, yesterday was uh, the notion of the inflection point. So that, that book actually, that phrase, the inflection point, came from a book called Structure of Scientific Revolution, uh, written by Dr. Thomas Kuhn. And you know, his observation was that whenever you have uh, these immense changes in uh, scientific worldview, whether it's from Copernican to Newtonian or Newtonian to Einsteinian, from a distance, it looks like it happened overnight. Right? It looks like um, uh, it looks like it was actually done by one person, but in reality, in each one of these uh, revolutions, it was actually done by a whole bunch of people, by a community, sometimes competitors, sometimes collaborators, and you know the the fate the the, the Kuhnsian moment is really, uh, he compares it to sublimation. Like uh, in an instant, air becomes like, uh, a gas becomes like a solid. And I think what I find so exciting is that you know, the Kuhnsian moment of the deployment age, you know, I think is going to be created by this community. I, over the, I've had the privilege of studying this community for five years and to see how we've advanced the practice and learn from each other. Uh, There's a conviction I have that the Kuhnsian moment will be created by organizations just like in this room. So, um, another aha moment I had yesterday was this maybe new conviction that the most important business leaders who will be driving their organizations forward, helping advance the most important business objectives in the next five to 10 years are likely in this room. I love what Randy Lyons from Nike said. He said, business leaders, he is not a technology leader playing business. He is a business leader with a technology background. <laughs> and so uh, for me, that has a, was a startling difference in perspective. And I think I'll be carrying that around for uh, years to come. And, and so I think all the people who have been presenting, uh, they are, going to be, they are either are business leaders um, with a technology background or they will become the business leaders uh, with a technology background uh, that have earned uh, the right to lead some of the most important initiatives of the organization because everybody knows that they have the best long-term interests of the organization at heart. So um, I just want to, the reason why I share that with you is just uh, I had made some very uh, wild claims yesterday and I'm hoping that you find this as persuasive as I have. So a couple of um, announcements on us to change tempo slightly. Um, one big thing that we are going to be doing differently in 2019 is that um, we're actually going to have three days of programming instead of two. One of the things that we discovered on the programming committee side is that there aren't enough speaker slots. <laughs> and so uh, we're actually going to be increasing the conference to three days just like the US conference. And I think that will be uh, hopefully a great thing. So uh, stay tuned for more news on that. Uh, yes, feel free to applause. Um, the second thing is I want to announce that uh, uh, we actually did a special uh, print run of uh, these USB drives with an abridged version of the Beyond the Phoenix project. I have to tell you, this is probably one of the most uh, intellectually satisfying um, achievements of my professional career. This is uh, something I did with John Willis. We recorded eight hours of audio uh, based on hundreds of hours of research. And uh, so everyone, if you go to the IT Rev booth, and we'll post exact details uh, in the Slack channel, uh, you can get a USB drive uh, with the, uh, I think many of them are actually signed. Um, so I'm delighted that they actually made it here. As first, we actually made them just for this event. Last announcement. Um, Richard, Dr. Richard Cook uh, mentioned yesterday that he will be hosting a session yesterday. So here are the details. At 15.15, uh, at 3.15 today, breakout room D, uh, if you want to hang out with Richard Cook uh, and either learn more or hear the questions that he has for you, I highly encourage you to go to this. Uh, one of the things that we got to do in the Beyond the Phoenix project is spend time with Richard Cook and I hope that you find uh, your experience collaborating with him as rewarding as it has been for me. So uh, this is the details um, for uh, Richard Cook's session, and he actually posted this slide in the Slack channel, in, in the general channel. So with that, Jeff Gallimore. <laughs>